Well, hello, everyone, and welcome virtually to the UCLA School of Law. I'm Russell Karopkin, and I have the honor of serving as Dean of the Law School and welcoming you to today's exciting program. Uh, this program is the latest installment in our From the Front Lines virtual series. Uh, we at UCLA Law are very fortunate to have faculty, alumni, and friends who are among the foremost experts in the legal, social, and political issues at the heart of current events. And this series allows us to share that expertise. Um, we work very hard here at UCLA to recruit the best legal scholars in the country to our faculty. We don't succeed all the time, but this year we really hit a home run when we convinced Rick Hassan, who I think is the top election law scholar in the country, to join the UCLA law faculty. So today's event is not only part of the From the Frontline series, it's also part of a new series of webinars offered through our Safeguarding Democracy Project, which Rick is directing. And Rick will be moderating today's all-star panel of journalists in a candid conversation about the United States Supreme Court and the future of American democracy. Most of you know Rick uh, not only as an election law scholar, but a frequent columnist on election law and related issues in really too many publications to mention, as well as an analyst for CNN. So I'm happy now to hand it over to Rick. Thank you so much, Dean Karopkin, and welcome everyone to the third in our fall webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project. I wanna thank Harley Hamm for her important logistical support today. And I wanna tell you about some of the upcoming programs of the project before we turn to today's program. All of our programs this semester are online and free, but registration is required. On September 29th at noon Pacific time, I will be in conversation with Representative Adam Schiff on the topic, Lessons from the January 6th Committee, a conversation with Representative Adam Schiff. On October 14th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time in conjunction with Stanford Law School, the project will sponsor a conference with the topic, Should Donald Trump be Returned to Social Media? And on October 27th at noon Pacific time, I'll be in conversation with the New York Times Maggie Haberman on the topic Trump, Trumpism, and the future of American democracy. Again, all of these events are free and online. If you want to sign up for these events, uh, there'll be links in the chat. You can also go to the Safeguarding Democracy Project website at safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Today, I'm thrilled to bring together three wonderful Supreme Court reporters and, and good friends to talk about the topic of the Supreme Court and American democracy. I'll briefly introduce our very illustrious panelists. You can find their full biographies posted on the Safeguarding Democracy Project uh, webpage for this event. Joan Biskupic is a full-time CNN legal analyst. She's covered the Supreme Court for 25 years and is author of uh, several books on the judiciary. Before joining CNN in 2017, she spent a year visiting as a professor where I was at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. She was previously editor in charge for legal affairs at Reuters and before that position, the Supreme Court correspondent for the Washington Post and USA Today. She most recently published a biography of Chief Justice Roberts. Her previous books include Sandra Day O'Connor, American Original Life and Constitution of Justice Anson Scalia and Breaking in the Rise of Sonia Sotomayor and the Politics of Justice. A graduate of Georgetown University Law School, Biskupic was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Explanatory Journalism in 2015. Adam Liptak is Supreme Court correspondent of the New York Times. After attending Yale Law School, Liptak worked in the Times legal department, spending a decade advising the Times and the company's other newspapers, television stations, and new media properties on defamation, privacy, news gathering, and related issues. And he frequently litigated media and commercial cases. He's taught courses on the Supreme Court and the First Amendment at the University of Chicago Law School, New York University Law School, and Yale Law School. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He joined the Times new staff in 2002 and began covering the Supreme Court in the fall of 2008. He's written a column sidebar on developments in the law since 2007. His series on the United, how the United States legal system differs from other developed nations, American Exception, was a finalist for the 2009 Pulitzer Prize. Dahlia Lithwick is senior editor at Slate, where she has written her Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence columns since 1999, 
Her work has also appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The New Republican Commentary, among other places. She's the host of Amicus, Slate's award-winning bi-weekly podcast about the law in the Supreme Court. In 2018, she received the American Constitution Society's Progressive Champion Award and the Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis. She won a 2013 National Magazine Award for her columns on the Affordable Care Act. She's twice been awarded an online journalism award for her legal commentary and was inducted in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2018. Her book, Lady Justice, got it in my hands, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America, publishes today. We're thrilled she's joining us on her book publication day. It's a must read for anyone who cares about justice, women's rights, and our current political and legal moments. All right, as I said, I'm thrilled to have you each here and uh, invite you to join the conversation. I'm gonna open with the same question for each of you, um, which is, uh, as we think about the Supreme Court, and on the one hand, we think about cases, controversial election cases, the court has decided from Citizens United to Shelby County. Uh, and we think about the role that the Supreme Court played in the 2020 election, uh, and among other things, rejecting a case brought by Kansas and, and other states to try to affect the outcome of the election. Uh, the question uh, to open, and I'm asking each to speak for five minutes, is has the Supreme Court been a protector of American democracy in the Roberts Court era? And uh, I'm going to give you each five minutes. So we'll go in this order, Joan, uh, Adam, and then Dahlia. So uh, let me first start with you, Joan. Thanks, Rick. And it's so nice to see everyone and to be here for this important panel. And uh, Dahlia, I just love that we're all here on your book publishing day. It's a book. In my initial answer, I'm going to focus on Chief Justice John Roberts, because unlike with the recent Dobbs abortion rights decision, he really is far more in control uh, in this area of the law. He's steering the ship on issues of extreme partisan gerrymandering and voter suppression. And in thinking of those issues, when Rick first said, uh, asked what told us what question he was going to pose, I couldn't help but rem be reminded of the chief's remarks at the Tenth Circuit recently when he talked not about democracy as we are today, but rather about the legitimacy of the uh, court. And he sounded absolutely in denial about how people were losing confidence in the court. The chief said he thought that the declining public opinion uh, as seen in multiple polls was just a matter of the public disagreeing with rulings and not uh, any kind of commentary on the legitimacy of the court. But people have not been questioning the court's legitimacy simply because they don't agree with rulings, as I think most of my panelists agree. It's because the decisions, uh, notably, notably in Dobbs, uh, abandoned precedent, uh, you know, had questionable legal rationales and reflected individual justices, partisan alliances. And I think, and of course, Roberts himself had claimed that Dobbs was a serious jolt, jolt to the legal system. So in thinking about the question today, I think Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts' disingenuousness on that question reflected a kind of willful obliviousness that I believe extends to the kinds of issues we're talking about here, issues that inform democracy. Um, consider the cases uh, on voting rights. He took control of Shelby County, of course, uh, Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, uh, the case that eviscerated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, in that he minimized any problems with uh, uh, voter discrimination famously said that things had changed in America, things had changed in the South. And we also know that he's long wanted to get rid of uh, or narrow, pardon me, narrow section two of the Voting Rights Act. And we'll, we'll certainly be able to test that uh, right away on the second day of the new term when the justices hear the case from Alabama, the Milligan case that will be argued then. And an equally crucial area of uh, the law for American democracy is, of course, partisan gerrymandering. And he, uh, where it seems like, you know, election results are, uh, are preordained, irrespective of the will of the people. And again, this is an area where we saw uh, John Roberts take the lead in 2019 in the Rucho case, where he said that uh, uh, federal judges couldn't be uh, couldn't involve themselves in extreme partisan gerrymandering. And I want to stress what we heard from him on that issue. Um, and we had, at first heard his, his sentiment uh, a year before the Rucho case 
in the prelude, uh, the 2018 Wisconsin uh, Gill case, where he said during oral arguments that what concerned him was that, uh, you know, the average man on the street would, or the intelligent man, he said the intelligent man uh, would look at what the justices had done and just consider them politically motivated. And th these were his words, let's say uh, the Democrats win. And that person would say, well, the Democrats win. It's because the Supreme Court preferred Democrats over Republicans. Um, actually, as we know in this line of cases, consistently the Republicans were in, win over Democrats. But taking him at his word, John Roberts was more concerned with the court's reputation and less concerned with how gerrymanders cause people to believe their votes are meaningless and necessarily lead to a loss of confidence uh, in the judicial system and a loss of faith in democracy. Uh, now, just think that that was 2019. And uh, that case, I think, gets to the broader question of where we're at with um, this you know, new Trump-affected court. We wouldn't have had that ruling we, if Brett Kavanaugh hadn't succeeded Anthony Kennedy and so solidly been ready to throw uh, throw his vote in with John Roberts. Uh, as you remember, Anthony Kennedy had been ambivalent on this topic, but it was it was with Justice Kavanaugh's vote that the chief was able to have five justices to sweep aside efforts by lower court judges to develop any standards for assessing when a partisan gerrymander is too much. Roberts insisted that the, you know gerrymanders are nothing new. He disputed the notion that map makers could even uh, predict electoral outcomes. And he concluded that regardless of whether they could, judges simply lacked the constitutional authority to address this kind of problem in democracy. Um, but we know that you know, elected legislators are picking their voters rather than voters picking them, as the dissent in that case observed. And I want to make another point that um, as I wrap up here, that you know, Elena Kagan dissented from the bench in Rucho. And in fact, that was the very last oral dissent we had from the bench uh, back in June, 2019, because nobody, none of the justices have been reading their opinions from the bench uh, since then, since COVID. And what she said was of all the times to abandon the court's duty to declare the law, this was not the one. The practices challenged in these cases imperil our system of government. Part of the court's role in that system is to defend its foundations. None is more important than free and fair elections. And that's where I'll close. Uh, that was 2019. Just consider what we've all seen since then about the threats to the foundations of government. John Roberts says he doesn't want to be involved in anything that smacks of politics, but he, like many of the country's leaders, seem uncertain how to respond to these clear threats to democracy today. The court plainly has a role in defending our constitutional system, especially the ideal of free and fair elections. And that ideal and Robert's role in preserving democracy or perhaps further dismantling the safeguards will be tested this session. And I look forward to talking about those cases today and hearing from my fellow panelists. Thanks, Rick. Thank you so much, Joan. And before I turn to Adam, let me just uh, remind you, uh, as was just mentioned in the chat, that if you have questions for our panelists, you can use the Q&A function. And I hope that we'll have some time to turn to at least some of those questions near uh, the uh, end of this session. Uh, Adam, let me turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Rick, and congratulations on this important new project. It's great to be here with you and with my good friends, uh, Joan and Dahlia. Delia, big congratulations on the book. It looks fantastic. Um, so let me build on Joan's remarks by contrasting a little bit about where we've come from before the Roberts Court. The Supreme Court, of course, has not been historically an entirely reliable uh, guardian of democracy. It hasn't always taken on that function that John Hart Ely said is the central function of the Supreme Court, which is to reinforce democracy. Uh, but in the 20th century, in a series of cases, it struck down poll taxes, it struck down white primaries, it struck down grandfather clauses, it uh, rejected a challenge to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, a, a serious challenge given how the law really did kind of turn federalism upside down and give uh, federal authorities uh, the ability to reject 
state voting procedures, and probably most importantly, in a series of seminal cases, it insisted on one person, one vote, rejecting malapportioned legislative districts. And in his memoirs, Earl Warren said that those were the most important cases of his tenure of Earl Warren's tenure. Earl Warren's tenure included Gideon against Wainwright and included Brown v. Board of Education. And yet he said that that move of reinforcing and protecting democracy was the most important feature of the Warren court. Now let's turn to the Roberts court and it's really another matter entirely. Uh, as Jones said, uh, the Chief Justice, the Roberts court, uh, said federal courts have no role to play in addressing partisan gerrymandering. It endorsed voter ID laws. It amplified the role of money in politics in a series of campaign finance decisions. It allowed purges of voter rolls and it effectively gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I was on a panel yesterday and I made some of these points uh, to Will Bode, a law professor at the University of Chicago. And he said, Yes, it's true that the court was not particularly supportive of democracy in those cases, but that's because, and there's some truth in this, that's because he said the constitution in places is not particularly supportive of democracy. The framers were a little wary of too much democracy. They were also willing to compromise uh, to persuade smaller states uh, to join the union. But I don't think that's a complete answer. And I do think we have a court now which consistently uh, allows for incursions of, on democracy. And as Joan was saying, it's very hard not to draw the conclusion that this is not a principled, but rather a partisan move. Because uh, as Michael Klarman, law professor at Harvard, uh, said in the Times the other day, the Justices may not say this, they may not even believe it, but it is the case that their agenda in these areas consistently advantages the Republican Party, which is the party whose presidents appointed the six justice supermajority. Well, on that, on that note, I think I'll turn it over to Lady Justice. Uh, Dahlia, uh, again, congratulations on uh, book publication day. Um, if you're interested in the book, you can find the link uh, in the chat. And uh, let me turn it over to you. Uh, there's actually no one I would rather spend uh, my publication date with than this panel. Uh, truly, uh, uh, just brains in vats. It's lovely to be with you. And uh, congratulations, Rick, on the work you're doing. Um, I think I want to start where Adam started and then kind of land up where Joan started, but maybe in a slightly more um, amped up way. Uh, I, I think what I would posit just in response to the question itself is that, you know, being a protector of democracy depends on both what, how you define protector and democracy. And you've now heard, you know, Adam and Joan both say that I, I think it's almost indisputable uh, with all due respect to Will Bode that if you define democracy as the meaningful right to vote, to have your vote counted, to adhere to the basic principle of one person, one vote, uh, to keep warping influences out of election, including uh, big troughs of dark money. Um, and, and then I think it's almost beyond dispute that the Roberts uh, court has done none of those things. Uh, and that is in fact how I, uh, like Justice Warren, uh, would define democracy. I guess if you define protector as hasn't sort of taken us right over into the abyss, Rick, then certainly, you know, props to the court for not intervening in uh, the 2020 election, for resisting what I think was a, a real imperative on the part of some of the court to get involved in that election in ways that would have, I think, been devastating. Uh, so, you know, maybe protector isn't the right word, but like non-annihilator is a word. And I, I wanna, you know, put it out there that it could have been much worse, but 
I think the flip of that is that using uh, that run up to the 2020 election to sow the seeds of serious meaningful meddling in the 2024 election, I think the court did that. And I think that's not protective of democracy. I think, I know we're gonna talk uh, about more v. Harper, but I think that the court has done an amazing amount of laying down track to really severely uh, disrupt democracy. You know this better than anyone, Rick, but in the years to come, and I think the court has, has had a real hand in legitimizing that. So I, I'm not willing to use the word protector. Uh, I will use the word not yet annihilator. Um, but I think the other element, and it's really important, and it's where Joan began, but I, I wanna pull on it a little bit in a different direction. I think that if, the legitimacy of the court itself is a marker of the court's work on protecting democracy, then I think we are in, you know, what I would say is borderline catastrophic region right now. And I think that it's not just this sort of internecine fight between John Roberts and Elena Kagan about whose fault it is that the court is being legitimized. I think that if we believe, and I do believe, that democracy itself rises and falls on the rule of law and the notion of an independent, nonpartisan judiciary, I think that in the last two, three years, the Roberts court has done catastrophic damage to democracy. And it's not just, again, the polling numbers are horrifying. A year ago, they were the lowest in the history of polling. Now they're lower. The latest NBC poll that I just looked at uh, uh, shows that this court's favorability ratings is at 35% positive, 42% uh, negative. I know that 35% positive rating sounds like stratospheric compared to congressional and presidential uh, approval ratings, but it's really dismal for a court that depends for its continued legitimacy only on public approval of its decisions. The other thing that the polling shows is that the, and this goes to Adam's point about advantaging one party, is that the disparity between Republican and Democrat support for the court is itself, I think, a harbinger of one side thinking the court is legitimate, the other side thinking it's not. And it seems to me that if it is the case, and I think it is the case, that a cornerstone of protecting democracy is protecting the court itself, and if it is the case, and I think, Rick, you posit this more strongly than I do, that the 2024 election may well be decided in the court, then we are in a really, really disastrous water if half the country thinks that the court is in the tank for whoever the Republican nominee is. And so I just want to very briefly say that what the court has done simply in the past two years, whether you talk about ethics violations and having no code of ethics, and really, I think not ethics violations like, you know, taking taking money or or uh, having a vested interest in a case, but you know, the, the spouse of a justice involved in a case from which he doesn't recuse himself, but also the partisan speeches, the shadow docket, and the use of the emergency docket to decide merits issues that are not properly briefed or argued or even in fact explained on the merits for future cases. The leak last year, which I think not only delegitimized the court to the country, but to itself is one of those things that I think the court will not soon recover from. And the attacks from the justices upon one another uh, in their speeches and in the ways they write, all of this really, I think, destabilizes the court itself in a way that, as Joan suggested up top, makes it almost impossible to understand how that same court can decide matters of who gets to vote and how they get to vote and uh, uh, how votes are counted. So I think I just want to end on this one point. You know, we, we've cited various cases, we'll cite various others. My mind always goes back to Caperton uh, because the, the, the lodestar of the Caperton decision is that how the people think about the court matters. And that's an objective test. It's not a test that says, oh, you're just grousing because you don't like outcomes. It is that if a third of the population thinks that the court is not in fact behaving as a court, then the court is to blame. The court and the judiciary and the Article Three judges upon it are the ones who are doing something wrong. 
And maybe I would just note, and I know we're going to talk about this too, that we're in this very, very worrisome moment when Justice Alito in his Dobbs opinion says, women are not without political power, right? If they don't like the outcome here, they should take themselves to the ballot box and rectify it uh, in the states. But when that comes from the same court that has done, as Adam and Joan just suggested, systematic efforts to repress and constrict the vote, it doesn't actually read, uh, as Joan says, you know, as willful obliviousness. It actually reads as straight up trolling. It reads as being told by the same court that is making it harder and harder to effectuate your will at the ballot box that the ballot box is your only recourse, it reads to a lot of us as the court being cynical about its own legitimacy. And I cannot emphasize enough going forward how dangerous that is, not just for Justice Alito, not just for John Roberts, but for democracy itself. Thanks. Uh, uh, so now I'm gonna open it up uh, to uh, all of you for a, a little bit of a broader discussion. And let me start um, with, with a little bit of pushback. Uh, this is somewhat of an odd position for me, but you know, here are you know among the most eminent uh, Supreme Court watchers in the country, and you all seem to have this um, unanimous view of the court as not a protector of democracy. And so let me push back and say that um, I think the federal courts and Republican justices were pretty heroic in 2020 in not uh, really buying at all into Donald Trump's attempts to try to um, change the outcome of the 2020 election. There was a one case that went to the Supreme Court from Texas where uh, the only two votes uh, in favor of even doing anything with the case came from Justices uh, Alito and Thomas who had been on record as saying, if one state files directly in the Supreme Court, we at least have to take the case and then we can dismiss it, uh, which seemed to be what they were saying. Uh, so, And the other thing I would point to uh, is um, there's now and we talked about this in an earlier Safeguarding Democracy Project website, there is now this um, bill to try to fix the rules for the um, counting of votes. And it points to the federal courts and ultimately the Supreme Court as the protector. It says if someone like a Doug Mastriano in, uh, in Pennsylvania, if he becomes governor, decides not to certify votes for Biden, that you then go to the federal courts. So uh, Adam, let me start with you and ask, you know, is there really no line between law and politics? And if that's true, you know, how do we understand how the courts behaved in 2020 when it came to post-election litigation? Yeah, so I, I take the point, Rick, and I sometimes get frustrated with uh, commentators on the left who, when the court occasionally does something that they approve of, will say, well, that's easy. That doesn't count because that's obvious, but it all counts. And you're right to say that uh, we should be grateful that the federal courts did what they did uh, in the aftermath of the 2020 election. But the original action filed in the Supreme Court was such a dog's breakfast of lunacy that it's hard to give them very much credit for rejecting that. Uh, I, I don't think they get zero credit but that's not really the shining example of grappling with, with a difficult issue. And just following up then uh, on this question of um, uh, the proposed legislation pointing to the federal courts, I guess I would say, if not the federal courts to protect democracy, then who? Then is it um, the Speaker of the House? Uh, is it state legislatures? So is the Supreme Court maybe the least worst uh, choice there. You, you're not going to do better than the courts, but that's not saying much. And you say the federal courts, and we'll talk about more against Harper. I think the state courts and the state Supreme Courts might have a role too. Yeah, let me turn uh, there and let me turn to Joan and, and talk about this Moore versus Harper case. We had a whole um, uh, Safeguarding Democracy Project webinar on that. And, yeah, I should say you can find all of these uh, uh, recordings of these earlier sessions uh, on the Safeguarding Democracy Project website. But, but Joan, one of the questions that's going to face the court uh, in the Moore versus Harper case uh, is about the relative role of federal courts versus state courts in having the right to protect democracy. Um, seems to me that you know one of the questions is about originalism. 
uh, and you know what the original public meaning was of the part of the Constitution in Article One, Section Four, that says the state legislatures get to set the matter for con conducting federal elections. But another part, and this ties into your comments, uh, is about the Supreme Court's legitimacy. And what is it going to mean if the Supreme Court has to keep second guessing state courts on whether they're properly applying state law? So, uh, Joan, can you talk a little bit about how you think? Roberts, Kavanaugh, the institutionalists on the court might respond in a case like this? Uh, yes, uh, I just wanna say one thing about your very good question about um, the federal courts generally though, Rick, I would draw a line between what the Supreme Court itself did in the 2020 election and what the lower court judges did because you did have people like Judge Beavis from the third and you know plenty of district court judges along the way, uh, Judge Pepper from uh, Wisconsin all saying, why are these cases here? Get rid of these cases. So there was a firewall. The court didn't. The Supreme Court didn't have to do as much, but now the Supreme Court has taken a case that I think you uh, doubted at one point they might take, and I personally doubted whether this was the be best case for them to take on the uh, independent state legislature doctrine that would would essentially let uh, state legislatures have the final word whether, rather than state courts interpreting in their own constitution. I actually think as important as this case is and how much I think it's gonna deserve every bit of attention that we all give it uh, when arguments are set likely for sometime in December or January. But I'm wondering if this is one of the ones that Justice, uh, the chief and maybe uh, Justice Kavanaugh might pull back on. It could have so many consequences for both obviously the elections clause and the electors clause that and and just what that would say if the Supreme Court were to come in and essentially just negate the powers of state courts interpreting state constitutions in favor of politically driven entities. So um, obviously we've already had uh, several justices, including Justice Kavanaugh, uh, uh, expressed interest in this. Uh, it, Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Alito have been the strongest proponents of this. Uh, they pick it up, it picks up from uh, Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist's uh, three justice opinion in Bush v. Gore that uh, criticized the Florida State, uh, Supreme Court in favor of the legislature on that whole mess. But, and it was Brett Kavanaugh back in a Wisconsin case in 2020 who invoked the chiefs, the late chiefs, uh, um, uh, what would we call it? I guess it was a concurring opinion, a concurrence. It couldn't even draw Justices O'Connor and Kennedy onto it. It was a it was a weak concurrence. But it was. But my point is that as much as Brett Kavanaugh has toyed with that, and Justices Gorsuch, Alito, and uh, Thomas have seemed a little bit more all in. I think I think they might hesitate. It's too big. It's just too big in terms of consequences for democracy. So Dahlia, do you think that uh, Brett Kavanaugh is going to be the uh, savior of American democracy? And could, could you reflect more broadly on this question of, if not the courts, who, who is going to safeguard democracy in 2024? No, I'm 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 with you and Adam on the latter question. I don't think there's another institution uh, that can do this. And I don't think that there's another institution that should do this, which is why I'm so worried uh, that the court doesn't seem to be trying to immunize itself against uh, the kinds of critiques about partisanship that are really pretty easy, actually, to, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard to have the members of the court not flying around giving partisan speeches. So that's a choice that the justices have made, but as a consequence, I think that they need to understand that, yes, they are the best suited branch, as Adam says, but every single action taken to undermine their own legitimacy makes them less well suited and uh, I think the public less likely to abide. One thing I do want to interject into this is that I actually think this isn't a static question. I mean, we're talking about the Roberts Court as though it hasn't changed. And I think probably we can all agree in some version or another that whatever the trends is that that, that, that we're describing, you know, whether it's blessing uh, partisan gerrymandering, blessing vote suppression, uh, voter ID, that it's accelerated really quickly and that a year ago, had we had this conversation, I think we would have been, at least I was more apt to say, 
they're mindful of these legitimacy questions. They're not going to kind of do everything at once. They'll pick and choose the areas in which they want to go big. And I would have been wrong. Uh, they decided to go big on almost every question that they could go big. And so I think my answer, Rick, about the question of what do the institutionalists do? Look, we saw Roberts and um, Kavanaugh, you know, just make a decision to do the institutionalist thing in the Yeshiva University case, right? So clearly appearances matter to them. But what I think when I talk about things changing over time is that ideas that might have been, as Joan suggests, it would have been anathema to take this independent state legislature case even a year ago, I think that there's an emboldened quality <laughs> that we're seeing play out now where things that six months ago, I couldn't imagine the court doing, the court now seems to be prepared to do. I guess what I'm saying is there's no breaking mechanism. And even the in institutionalists, quote unquote, don't seem apt to pump the brakes. So I'm not super, super confident that even things that seemed unthinkable a year ago aren't absolutely, you know, to use the Jack Balkin expression, you know, they're, they're not off the wall anymore, they're on the table. And I think that one of the things that worries me is that I can't quite figure out why the accelerant is happening, but it's quite clear to me that that's the trend. And I think that that accelerant just to, to wrap up, means that A, Justice Roberts is immaterial, right? He's, he's with the dissenters on institutionalism. And I think that Justice Kavanaugh can be, can be pulled along with that accelerating quality uh, so that things that even he would have said no to a year ago are now thinkable. Yeah, we did see some interesting maneuvering in the early part of the but both the, the Moore versus Harper case, and uh, I want to bring in the, the uh, case out of Alabama, the Al Alabama congressional redistricting case, the, the Milligan uh, versus Merrill case, uh, where you know there was a question about emergency relief beforehand, and Kavanaugh did pull back and said, uh, you know, it's a, we're not going to reverse the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, I'm not going to reverse the North Carolina Supreme Court before there's been a decision, and in the um, uh, Milligan case, you know, there was a question about the timing and, and all of this. And, and Roberts had this very interesting opinion where he said, uh, a concurring opinion, uh, I guess it was concurring, I agree on the merits that um, we need to rethink Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and, and maybe make it less uh, minority plaintiff friendly, but let's not go too far too fast. And, and Joan, you know, this has been a theme of yours and when you were writing about um, Roberts in uh, in your book that, you know, he, he's playing the long game, wants to do things slowly, and he's going against what uh, our friendly Lippman calls the YOLO court, a court that's really willing to move too quickly. Does Roberts, uh, Joan, does Roberts have any control over the, if, if not the trajectory of the court, the speed by which the court goes, you know, just in terms of as, if his role as the Chief Justice? I think he he doesn't have control over the speed, as we obviously saw in Dobbs. I think this is, you know, the chief did not favor abortion rights, uh, probably at a whole nother time, uh, if it hadn't come to the court in that strange way when the question presented didn't even test Roe as directly as uh, the ultimate ruling did. Uh, he could he would easily have been a a, a vote to overturn Roe at some point, uh, not in 2022. So he's not controlling the speed right now, but he's definitely controlling the trajectory. He is with this trajectory. If there's a through line in John Roberts' jurisprudence and his life, it would be on racial remedies. And uh, he, he has, as I think all of us uh, participating today are aware, from his time in the Ronald Reagan administration, he has argued very strongly against a uh, broad or even a, a, a consistent uh, interpretation of section two of the Voting Rights Act. He, was, he, he wanted it uh, scaled back back in the early 80s. He's always wanted to scale back. And even though he hesitated on the, the stay question, I think he will get what he wants down the road on this. And uh, that is that he is trying to minimize any kind of remedies for racial injustice across the board, 
we'll see that not just on uh, voting rights this, this session, but likely on racial affirmative action on campuses too. This, this, is, this is what really matters to him and he gets it. And Adam, let me ask you about uh, Justice Barrett. Um, she's now had a full term on the court. Um, she hasn't written very much about voting rights, but she's been, been a, a kind of a voting mostly in lockstep on these questions with the other most conservative justices. Do we have any insights? I, I remember listening to her in the Brnovich oral argument. That was a case involving another aspect of Section 2 last year. And, and she sounded much more open than you know how she ended up voting with that Alito opinion. So a, a couple of things. Uh, the, the data on Barrett are really not in, and particularly in this area, all we know about her is what we know about her generally, which is that she's a committed conservative, and therefore she might well go with her colleagues uh, on the right side of the Roberts Court on these election things. Uh, at the same time, I agree with you, Rick, she is particularly on the bench, uh, a very thoughtful uh, questioner and one who doesn't seem dug in. And occasionally in an emergency application setting, she will write a brief concurrence saying something quite sensible, like for instance, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's not let litigants use the emergency application docket as a way to get preview previews of, of big decisions on difficult questions with inadequate briefing and no oral arguments and dashed off orders. So there are glimmers of uh, someone who might have institutional impulses, but let me finish where I started. We really don't have a lot of information on her based on her work at the court. So yeah, I, I, I like you bring up that point about the shadow docket, these emergency cases. And, and Dahlia, let me turn back to you. You were saying that you know if the justices wanted to, there are ways that they could kind of turn down the heat, raise their uh, bipartisan legitimacy. You know, this is a court for the first time where all the conservatives, the first time in modern uh, era where all the conservatives on the court were appointed by presidents of one party, all the liberals by another. You mentioned one thing, which is not going around and giving partisan speeches. Um, would you put reform of the shadow docket on there? What else goes on that list? If, if the court really wanted to help preserve itself as, as, as a safe, a, 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 as an entity that's safeguarding democracy. I mean, I think this is a place where we can get a lot of guidance from that blue ribbon commission that President Biden put together. Um, you know, they didn't agree on the big structural reforms, right? There was no agreement on court packing or jurisdiction stripping or, um, you know, really much agreement even on term limits. But the places that there was broad agreement tended to be these issues of transparency. Uh, you know, issues of making uh, the court's work uh, manifestly open and clear to the public. And so I think that these are easy, easy fixes. And I started with ethics reform and I'll land on ethics reform, which is, it's just really not difficult. The court has been saying for years that it's considering uh, having a code of ethics that applies to itself, that isn't purely advisory. Uh, this is, this seems to me like low hanging fruit to just do a little bit of what I think is just little interior kind of design on how we, you know, move the potted plant here and, and, and put some ashtrays around and make it look as though the court actually wants the public to, to be invited in and to see the court's work. And so certainly the shadow docket is of a piece with that because I think, you know, as Adam just said, you can't do back of the napkin orders uh, that are binding on future courts and think that that's you know, satisfactory for a public when your only institutional job is to show your work. So I think I put the shadow docket there, but I think just this bucket of ethics reforms, appearances reforms, putting aside court expansion and, 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 and other things that the court you know, would hate to do and we would have very hard conversations about whether it could be done, but I think a commitment to the idea of transparency, um, conflict of interest rules and meaningfully enforcing that would go a long, long, long way actually to convincing the public that the fix isn't in. And Joan, uh, I'm coming back to you as the Roberts whisperer here. Um, do you uh, have a sense that any of this is in the cards? And, and maybe you can weave in here 
And one thing that we know is that that Dobbs opinion was leaked. We don't know by who. And there was a, I, I think it was Justice Gorsuch made some comments at a 10th Circuit conference and maybe um, there's gonna be a report which may or may not be public. Do you have a sense of uh, if Roberts is gonna move on any of these things in a way that could help to shore up the legitimacy of the court? He has been talking internally about some sort of ethics code for a while. The problem, is, first of all, I don't know how committed he would be to it personally. He's certainly committed to trying to improve their reputation. And frankly, I think it would take so little for them to be more transparent. They've obviously in the past several months tried to stop those late night shadow docket orders. It probably wasn't too hard for them to stop that. Uh, they've tried to, they obviously even set a couple cases for oral arguments that they uh, previously would have just done on the shadow docket. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the COVID one um, earlier this year, and then also obviously on SB8. So there are things they can do. First of all, they have to frankly acknowledge that they even have a situation here. I, I, think, I think there's a certain kind of denial across the board. And you gotta remember that the same way that the chief doesn't con can't control the majority anymore because he's not at the ideological middle, he he really doesn't have that much authority over his colleagues. Uh, you know, Clarence Thomas and the issues with his wife Jim Ginny Thomas. There's not there's not much he can do on that, and and there's no uh, there seems to be no real uh, movement force within the nine justices to say, you know, we have, we have to watch this more. You know, I have to say back when uh, uh, Justice Scalia uh, got in trouble over the duck hunting, you know, back in the early 2000s, he, he faced pressure among his colleagues. He was really angry about it, about how uh, the issue of whether he was gonna recuse in the Dick Cheney case, he ended up not recusing, of course, uh, and also putting out that, that statement about, he, about why he wouldn't. At least he put out a statement about it. But you know, several of his colleagues really got on, on him for that. And I don't, I don't think you have that anymore up there. You, first of all, the conservatives close ranks so much against those of us on the outside. It's almost like they can't be told anything. And in so many different areas, they're getting less transparent. Those financial disclosure forms are getting, you know, more minimal, uh, certainly more minimal than they they were when I first started covering the court. What goes on them? These justices, you know, they go off and give speeches without telling anybody where they're going. They sign these multi million dollar book deals. You know, all these things that that uh, raise questions about uh, exactly what they're doing and who they might be beholden to at, without giving us answers. I think that. The, it's in the chief's interest and it's in a majority, the majority's interest to start doing something. So I think we might see some small movement, but nothing, nothing of significance, Rick. So we only have about 10 minutes left. I want to turn to some of the questions. And uh, Adam, let me start with you. One of the questions asked about um, Bush versus Gore and the one day only ticket, you know, back in the year 2000. And, you know, Justice Scalia was famous for saying, get over it uh, when, when people would ask him when he did speak publicly about the case. And in some ways, I think the public did get over it. There was a lot of democratic anger when the Supreme Court decided the case that effectively handed the election to George Bush over Al Gore. But, but then um, public opinion rebounded uh, on uh, you know, the popularity or legitimacy of the court. Maybe we're just in another one of those moments and Dobbs will fade and, um, and we'll, we'll be you know, back to where we were five years ago. What do you think of that idea? Uh, I'm skeptical. Um, it's true, uh, as Justice Breyer used to say all the time, he said, I was in dissent in Bush v. Gore, but isn't it great <clears> that the day after the decision was handed down, there weren't riots in the streets, but people accepted what we had to say. And the most important thing is for people to do what the Supreme Court tells them to do, even if it's the opposite of what I would have them do. And that's one school of thought. Uh, and I think you can maybe get away with a Bush v. Gore, you know, once every 20 years. Uh, but these days, it looks like a six to three majority, uh, three members of which were appointed by President Trump uh, with, to put it charitably, through real congressional hardball, uh, and then promptly delivers not only Dobbs, but a guns case a climate change case, 
two religion cases, all decided by 6-3 votes, all along predictable lines, all with six Republican appointees in the majority, three Democratic appointees in dissent. That's a different picture from uh, from a, a Bush v. Gore one-off. Yeah, and I want to I want to dive a little deeper into Dobbs. And Dahlia, you mentioned this earlier, so let me come back to you. Um, you know, when I think about the Supreme Court and democracy, primarily I start thinking about the campaign finance cases like Citizens United and the, and the voting rights cases. Um, but all of these cases become political issues, cases like Dobbs or, or, or the EPA case about climate justice. And so I'm just wondering, thinking more broadly and philosophically, um, what uh, is the current role of the Supreme Court in terms of um, the uh, control it has over public policy in the United States on these very deep questions? I would say one of the things that I took away from Dobbs on these questions of the Supreme Court and legitimacy, this is a bit orthogonal to your question, but, but bear with me for a second, is that given the opportunity to change the leaked draft, Justice Alito didn't take it. And that brilliant historians fact-checking in real time, you know, physicians fact-checking in real time, um, constitutional law scholars fact checking in real time said, no, the, the, these five things are actually descriptively incorrect and he didn't change it. And that to me signaled a little bit of what I'm sort of calling this accelerant, you know, the quality that like we can do it. And, and again, that would have been a very easy fix to take out some of the sharp language or the words that were deliberately inflammatory. And the choice not to do that, I think is very telling about what Joan is describing about a court that's sort of not super interested uh, in pulling back from the idea that because we say so is the sort of last line of, of these six, three opinions. And so I think on the sort of institutional question, one of the things that I found most troubling last year, and I think this goes to how government itself is structured and maybe it's a good coda to, you know, to have a functioning democracy, you need a functioning court, is that to have a functioning democracy, you need a functioning administrative state, you need to not have contempt for school officials who are doing their level best to figure out, you know, what the boundaries of the First Amendment law uh, on prayer is, not have contempt for the people at CDC who are trying to get through a lethal pandemic, and you know, not have contempt for the EPA and its decision makers. One through line that really did actually chill me this year was the casual contempt that came up in opinion after opinion for people who are lifelong public servants who are trying to do their jobs, figuring out who gets a gun license in New York and who doesn't. And they're written off in these majority opinions as though they're all completely corrupt or stupid. So I think one structural question that I really have coming out of the term is what do you do with nine justices who don't seem to believe in government very much anymore? Yeah, and, and we're almost out of time. And I, I want to turn to Joan to look into the near future, to, to the upcoming term. And, you know, some of the big items besides the voting cases that we've talked about, one of them is affirmative action. Uh, another has to do with um, the clash between LGBT rights and religious liberty. I mean, how do you think that all uh, is going to fit into this question of you know, this polarized court in a polarized country? And you're muted, Joe. It wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a Zoom webinar. Okay, without yeah, without somebody forgetting to <laughs> unmute or not knowing how. Yeah, uh, I think both of those. It's almost like there's no turning back. I'm sorry to say, uh, I, again, I, we don't have to worry about what the chief is going to do. The chief in uh, the chief um, it dissented in Obergefell, the 2015 case that gave uh, same-sex marriage marriage is a found a fundamental right in the Constitution. He was very much against that. He's been so against uh, remedies for racial injustice or or for diversity or for any any reasons. And uh, so they don't need his vote, but uh, they will have his vote for those. And on, uh, I'll, I'll primarily say on, on racial affirmative action, you know that that thing's been teed up by the same the same uh, advocates who gave us Shelby County versus Holder that played right to the chief and uh, the 
uh, UNC and Harvard cases are playing right to uh, him. And the one thing I would just say on the, uh, the gay rights case that's coming up, so many people have asked whether, given what Clarence Thomas wrote in his concurrence in the Dobbs case about uh, same-sex marriage and other really important privacy rights, will the court go back on those? Maybe not, but I think we've seen the end of the era where we're going to have generous decisions that fall on the side of gay rights in issues that aren't as fundamental as marriage, but certainly affect uh, anti-discrimination laws. And Adam, I'll leave the final question with you and, and ask you to look a little further on the time horizon. Where do you think the Supreme Court's going to be uh, and the country is going to be if we look five or 10 years down the road? And, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about uh, democratic arguments for court packing, I mean, are we going to be living with a nine justice polarized Supreme Court going down the road? You know, we had... Um before the chief came on <clears throat> a court without personnel changes for 11 years. And then in the last period of time, there have been quite frequent changes, but now we have a relatively by Supreme Court standards, young Supreme Court, and one where this array of personnel may be with us for some time, meaning that whatever happens with the political branches, we are likely to have a powerful conservative counterweight uh, for years and years. And I think there are people on not only the hard left, but the moderate left who are thinking it, it may be time to think about solutions that seemed radical uh, on the theory that as the topic of this conversation suggests, the stakes couldn't be higher once in a while, you do have to break the glass and pull the emergency lever. And you also have to ask the question of what would the other side do if the shoe was on the other foot? And there are serious legal scholars who say, don't be afraid of tit for tat, because you would definitely have the other side do this if they were in your shoes. I don't know whether those are the right ways to think about it, but I do have the sense that there is an increasing interest in thinking about structural fundamental changes, given that we may be going into an era without changes in the court for years and years. Well, uh, Joan Biskupic, Adam Liptak, Dahlia Litwick, thank you all so much. Uh, this has been a uh, sobering, but very uh, edifying conversation. Uh, let me thank you all again uh, for tuning in. Um, the next uh, uh, webinar in this series is September 29th at noon, where I'll be speaking with Adam Schiff. Uh, thank you all for being here today. More information at safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. I'm Rick Hassan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rick.